Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. So Henri Bergson, um, the last video we talked about the self, we looked at uh, those two different kinds of selves, the original self, which is fundamentally duration, that, multi that uh, qualitative multiplicity. So it's a process. Um, it's, it's something that, it's that, 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 totality which is a multiplicity or that unity which is a multiplicity and the multiplicity that is a unity um, and the other as opposed to the other kind of self which is a spatialized self or, or an ego um, and we'll kind of we'll, we'll kind of touch on that again in this in this video so in this one we're going to be looking at freedom uh, and this was this was actually a really is this a challenging video to prepare for I, uh, I I could gathered all of my notes and I was going through it uh, yesterday no worries free work, freedom that yeah, good 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 and then I got to this this last section I'd, I'd written I'd, I'd noted like three sentences from creative evolution and it they didn't fit at all and it seemed at first glance like this was a, a kind of contradictory to what I just just prepared for, um, what I just spent like an hour preparing for beforehand. So it took me ages to think about this, but that, that's why I like one of the reasons I like doing these videos is just that. You know, it, I, I come up, I, I discover things that otherwise I wouldn't have noticed. Um, so I had to reconcile this, and I think I think the result is. Um, a more complete picture of Bergson's account of freedom. Hopefully, you can be the judge of that. But um, but yeah, hopefully you'll you'll enjoy this and uh, and we'll get something out of it. So let's kick off with freedom, and we'll start by looking at two arguments that Bergson gives for determinism. So determinism in time and free will. Bergson gives us two arguments. He gives us a physical argument for determinism and a psychological one and he says that the physical actually reduces to the psychological so that's the one that um, he really needs to dismantle so let's start with the physical argument uh, and the first thing he notes here is that if we're thinking about physical determinism um, obviously that's going to involve particles or matter and the first thing he notes is that the idea that brain states cause psychic states or that the movement of physical particles should somehow produce non-physical conscious states is absurd. Uh, and I think that that's, I'm pretty sure I've said this before um, already, we're only five videos in, but I'm pretty sure I've said it before that, yeah, that this, this notion that you can somehow get psychic states, mental images or mental representations from a physical object like the brain is, um, it, it's, it's just starting at the wrong place already, you know, it seems, it seems wrong, which is, it's, which is strange because that's the direction that, that everybody is investigating consciousness from starting with this idea that um, the brain generates consciousness, emergence, and then how? That's the next question. But we've been, we've been floundering around this how for years now, for decades, and we haven't made any progress. We've found, sure, we, we might have uncovered some neural correlates of consciousness, these parts of the brain... Um, light up or these parts of the, of the brain are active when we're doing or thinking this particular thing but th this is nothing more than correlation there, there's absolutely nothing um, there's no explanation behind any of this nothing indicating even that brain states cause psychic states so I really like this position of Bergson and, and I've I've um, called him in this in this particular case i've not uh, i've 
I, I think in this particular case, he's he's out materializing the materialists because he's saying <clears throat> the brain is just a physical object. It's no different from other physical objects. It doesn't produce consciousness or psychic states. It can't. It's a physical object. That, and that, that's the, I mean, that's what materialism is, right? Everything is physical and there, there is nothing um, non-physical or everything reduces to the physical at least. But, uh, but this is what materialists seem to be looking for now is they want to get consciousness from this physical object, which means that this physical object is pretty special. Right, it's it, now the the mystery is is now in the physical object, the brain, and this physical object then is not like other physical objects. It has this special capacity, this special power to do something, to create images, um, and that to me seems like just just a non-starter from the beginning. So. I really like this. I'm really a big fan of this idea that brain states do not cause psychic states. You don't get um, non-physical, the non-physical from the physical. And so uh, ultimately, when we get to creative evolution, Bergson's going to tie this into a, a kind of a greater metaphysical theory, um, which doesn't require... A physical object to produce non-physical stuff somehow. So that's cool. So the first thing is that his main um, foil in this section when, he, when he's discussing physical determinism is the argument from the conservation of energy. So the principle of the conservation of energy, um, however much energy is, is in a closed system to begin with, that's the amount of energy that stays in that system. You can't increase it uh, or decrease it. It just changes form. Um, and this is important for the argument from determinism because what it says is um, <clears throat> if you've got this closed system, you can't, in, free will is like an injection of energy into that system because it, 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 it causes things to happen that otherwise wouldn't, that otherwise couldn't. So, so, so there's this energy, I mean that in a kind of a physics sense, this energy is, is coming in um, and it's adding to the total energy in the system, which is, is a violation of the conservation of energy. So Bergson doesn't deny the conservation of energy. That principle is fine. Um, what he does do, though, is say that it only applies to systems in which objects or, or particles, after moving, can return to their original positions, where this also amounts to saying that they have returned to the original state. So that the, the new state, the, or the second time that these particles come into the same configuration that they were in originally, that is exactly the same. It's identical to the first, the original um, position. I'm not sure if I explained that well, but th so imagine you've got um, some particles in a system. They're arranged in this particular way. Let's call it configuration A. Then they move around for a while and eventually through random forces or whatever, they come back to the same configuration, configuration A. So now that they're here again, <clears throat> this, in order for the principle of the conservation of energy to be to apply to this system, that second time they come into configuration A is identical to the first time that they were in configuration A. If that is true, if that holds, then conservation of energy applies. And in other words, what I'm saying with that, or what Bergson's saying with that, is that systems in which the past has no meaning are systems in which the principle of the conservation of energy applies. So if, you know, so those 
those particles, they're in configuration A, they go off and wander around, come back to configuration A. The fact that they were in configuration A already has no bearing on this the second time they're in configuration A. The second time is identical in every respect to the first time. Um, the past has no bearing, has no um, the past doesn't feature in this in this system. There is no such thing as past. It's to return to the to the an original state is is a um, <clears throat> is identical because the past doesn't apply here. The past has no meaning. Now that's obviously not true for human beings. We've already discussed that. It's not duration a being which exists as a, qual a qualitative multiplicity existing in time, so enduring, that being, we've already seen, if, if um, a human, let's, and it's good to take the example in the Low Ponte actually of uh, someone who's seen, is it a Rembrandt? I forget, but someone who's seen, a, um, let's say a Rembrandt, uh, if they see that Rembrandt again, that second time is not the same as the first just because they've already seen it once. So it doesn't matter if everything else is identical, if everything in the world is the same, the time that they, they come back to look at it the second time, that is not identical to the first just because they've already seen it once. So the past has relevance, the past has meaning here. When we're dealing with duration, um, and so that <clears throat> is why the principle of the conservation of energy doesn't apply to duration. Um, and so, is this is this uh, is this a fair claim then of Bergson? Why why does he say that the principle can only hold for these reversible systems, these systems in which the past has no meaning? Um, and the reason is, for it to be true, for the conservation of energy to be true, the past, i.e. the passage of time, cannot add anything new to the system. By definition, we've defined this system as a system in which um, there's, there is no, no extra energy can be added. Nothing new can come into the system. Energy can change form, but, but it can't create anything new, which means that the past um, can't add anything to the system. You can't have anything. If I see Rembrandt once, seeing it a second time, the first time I saw it adds nothing to that second viewing. If it does, something new has come into the system, which wasn't in there um, originally. And that's why... That that's why this this principle doesn't apply to systems in which duration is is the uh, the foundation, in which systems in which um, things endure, organisms or beings endure. Uh, but you might then ask, well, couldn't it? Couldn't this hold for psychic states? Couldn't we? Couldn't we say that? Imagine, instead of imagining, say, um, particles, imagine psychic states. <clears throat> Your psychic states are the way that I, that I feel or the way that I'm experiencing now when I'm looking at this Rembrandt. I go off and do other stuff, and then somehow everything reverses, including all of my psychic states. So that the, the, the feelings I felt when I was looking at the Rembrandt the first time, they also reverse. And when I come back to this, looking at the Rembrandt the second time, um, everything has just, including my psychic states, have reverted to the original position. Couldn't we say that? Perhaps. Pretty outrageous. That's a pretty outlandish claim. And uh, as Bergson says, it's a, it's a postulate with no evidence to back it up, that, that psychic states can reverse like this. 
For it to be true, he says, you'd have to presuppose that the duration lived by consciousness is the same as the duration which glides over the inert atoms without penetrating and altering them. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's a pretty big assumption. And it goes against everything that, that we've talked about up till now. So, um, and again, there's no evidence to, to, to even really suggest that, that it, that's true. But what this tells us then is that since that's where, that, that's where um, this line of inquiry is led to, to psychic states, tells us that physical determinism reduces to psychological determinism. And that's what we're going to look at now. So psychological determinism is basically associationism. Um, so the idea underpinning this form of determinism is that, well, this argument for determinism, is that psychic states cause other psychic states with the force of a necessitating cause. <clears throat> so one psychic state just leads to another psychic state, just like a, a, a causal chain, cause and effect, right? Uh, and it does so with the force of a necessitating cause. There's no other option. It must have been this way. It must be this way. And what this, this picture, though, imagines the mind to be a collection of psychic states, individual psychic states, each vying for supremacy, each, each kind of pushing. And the one that's strongest wins and pushes the other one out. And so you get this this picture of um, <clears throat> it's almost like um, it's trying it, it's, it's treating psychic states as if they are material things, you know, that, that just kind of bounce into each other. This 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 particle hitting this particle causes this reaction. This psychic state coming up causes another psychic state. So it's really reducing psychic states to something like physical objects um, <clears throat> and this is kind of the the modern neuroscientific picture i think uh, i was reading this was a while ago but david eagleman is the guy's name he's taught he was talking about the brain as or the mind as um, being working like a team of rivals so they're a team but there's this kind of rivalry this this um <clears throat> it's not psychic states that he that he talks about but he talks about um i think i forget the word he uses but kind of systems in the brain different systems different physical um, neurons connected in in such a way that they, that they form kind of a functional whole these systems vying for supremacy that that's the rivalry <clears throat> so it's kind of the way we think about the way we've come to think about the brain now and and by extension psychic states but the mistake of associationism for bergson is that it disregards the qualitative element focusing only on the geometric positions which look the same from the outside so it ignores that, remember we talked about this at the very beginning, the psychic states are intensities, not extensities. They're fundamentally experienced. They're something which um, you live, you don't kind of, and, and looking at them from the outside is totally different. So that kind of objective measurement quantitative approach doesn't tell us anything about psychic states we have to get into them we can only live them we can only experience them that's why they're intensities but associationism disregards that it treats these um, qualitative intensities as if they were quantitative extensities so we can measure them we can we can compare them to each other to others we can you know and that's what I was saying. We can we can treat them like like things, as if they were physical objects. Uh, but that is exactly what we cannot do for Bergson. 
um, <clears throat> so associationism operates with kind of a um, a false model, which makes it seem as if psychic states cause other psychic states inevitably, but but that's not what happens. And the example he gives here is it's an interesting one. He talks about smelling a rose. And we, we talked about this in the last video with um, tasting ice cream. Same kind of thing. For associationism here, you smell the rose. The perfume of the rose, the scent of the rose is objective. It's, it's the same for everyone. It's public. And what happens when you breathe it in, when you, when you smell it, certain ideas arise. And so that, that's the causal connection. Right, you breathe in this thing, you, you smell this thing, something happens um, in your brain or whatever, and this psychic state, this memory pops up. Uh, and it can be different for different people. Be, different people will associate different, have different memories associated with, with the smell of a rose. But we've got this objective thing, the smell of the rose, the scent of the rose, and then this connection, which triggers um, a memory to come up but what Bergson is saying with this is that that whole picture is a fiction there is this association doesn't exist anywhere we, we can't find it this is kind of like it's a, it's a kind of a, a narrower version of Hume's argument that um, we, we can't prove causality. We can't prove causation. We just, it's, it's just an inference. We never see causation. So Berg, Bergson's saying the same thing, but, but in, a, in a more restricted sense. Um, we, never, we can never actually see evidence of this association between the smell and this, the elicitation of this memory. But the picture... Treating it like this, imagining it like this, removes the personal element from the impressions the rose makes on us. It takes out that, it, it breaks the, the event, smelling the rose <clears throat> and um, having that memory, it breaks, that, it breaks them into two. And that break is an artificial break. It takes out what was personal in the smell of the rose. And, and puts it over here so that there's now this causal connection, this association between two things where there, where there actually isn't one. So what he says, and I really like this expression, in truth, I breathe in the recollections with the very scent. The scent itself is tinted with a particular coloring for any consciousness that smells it. That's a really nice way of thinking about this. We breathe in the recollections with the scent. So it's not saying, obviously, that there, there, there's memories in the scent, but it's saying that that event is, is, is one event, that whole thing. Breathing in the, the, the scent and the memories, that is, that is one event. We, we can't break it into two. Well, we can, but when we do, we are create, we're creating something artificial, something that's not really happening and it, it gives us this causal link which doesn't really exist rather the whole thing is is one package smelling the rose and the memories that's all one event <clears throat> uh, which is which is a really nice way of thinking about that and it just it gives the gives the lie to associationism where it creates these um connections these causal connections where there are none where there are none originally and because of that he says associationism only sees the self which contacts the world at its surface after having been imprinted by the objects it touches again dividing something which is fundamentally continuous connected and that that is exactly what we talked about last week with the spatialized self. Associationism treats or, or investigates the world through the spatialized self. And that's why we get this, this false picture. Okay, so that's determinism out. 
let's have a look now at um, metaphysical freedom. Okay, so metaphysical freedom. Right, <clears throat> the first thing to note is that Bergson doesn't call this, he doesn't make a distinction between metaphysical freedom and I'm going to call practical freedom. So there's no distinction in Bergson, but um, <clears throat> this is what I said at the beginning. It, it seems to me there has to be. Uh, otherwise, there's just no way to reconcile the freedom that he talks about in Time and Free Will and the freedom that he talks about very briefly. It's, it's only like, <clears throat> like a paragraph in Creative Evolution, which I was saying at the beginning just threw me for a loop yesterday. I just had to think about it. <clears throat> I had to stop um, preparing because I was just thinking myself in circles. I had to take a break and, and just kind of revisit the the, um, the, the video prep um, at different points during the day. That, that's kind of how I approach these things. But yeah, so I've got these two the, the conclusion, the result was these two accounts of freedom, metaphysical freedom and practical freedom, which I just want to be clear is are not in Bergson. Bergson doesn't distinguish between the two. So why do I call it metaphysical freedom? So this is the freedom that he talks about in Time and Free Will. <clears throat> and it's metaphysical because it's, it's a description of who we are, not a property that we have. So when... In time and free will, when he says we are free, he's not saying we are things which have this property of being free. He's saying in our essence, in the, the very core of what we are, the very core of what we are is freedom. And again, he doesn't he doesn't use those words. I'm, I'm kind of <clears throat> channeling. Sartre a little bit for this but but this is where I think it's pretty clear as I was preparing this Sartre got this notion from Bergson the same way that I, I did the same way that I came to <clears throat> finally understand what Bergson was getting at here yesterday was through this this the same idea that, that Sartre uses we are not free we're not free beings we are fundamentally freedom itself. <clears throat> and the, the reason is, well, we've, we've talked about this before, duration, continuity, that whole, um, all of those ideas that we've talked about, they are metaphysical truth. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat is just going crazy today. So duration and continuity is metaphysical truth. Duration is pure creation, so pure novelty. It's, it's, it's always original. And we are duration. That's what we fundamentally are. That was what the last video was about. The original self, the fundamental self, is um, it's a process. It's a process of that qualitative multiplicity that endures. That's, that's who we are. We're not a thing like other things, or in, a, in our very core anyway. And in, in the, the very, the metaphysical reality of, of, of who we are, of what we are, is duration. And since if we're duration, we are like duration, an ever-changing, always original creativity. So creativity, um, the new the original, it's, it's built into the very thing we are. And we're not things, but the very constrained by language of it a little bit here. Um, we, the process that we are, again, we're back to kind of talking in terms of nouns, but, but you have to, <clears throat> even though I'm using these words, you have, you have to kind of look behind them. I think I've talked about that before. So I'm using the words like, um, what we are, um, <clears throat> a process, which is, is already a noun, uh, but they're understood in this way, that there's this continual creation. It's ever new. It's always changing. It's always novel. And that's that's the idea. This is It's pure freedom. 
it's not a thing which is free it is we are freedom itself uh, and that as i um alluded to before is exactly what sartre says um and when i read that in sartre actually <clears throat> uh I, I i don't know if it doesn't really make sense in sartre that that idea the for itself is freedom it's not free and he says the same thing with temporality the for itself is temporality Ponti says the same thing um, time is subjectivity these things don't really fit in or that when I read them I felt kind of a little bit they were a little bit jarring because these guys are doing phenomenology and they were very clear they want no part of metaphysics they're not doing metaphysics they're not interested in metaphysics this is phenomenology and then suddenly we get these metaphysical propositions right that's a metaphysical claim that the for itself is temporality that's that's going beyond phenomenology and it's why it, it just they they kind of those things kind of stand out as a little bit strange in uh, Sartre and Meloponti because they're not doing metaphysics uh, and so it was always difficult for me to connect them to any any uh, to the rest of their philosophy I think that this is why that they, they they're kind of smuggling in a little bit of metaphysics because you have to if you're going to to, to ultimately talk about what um, the for itself is or what uh, subjectivity is you've got to have a little bit of, of metaphysical grounding but but yeah these statements just for me anyway <clears throat> they just kind of pop out of nowhere and it's suddenly like hold on where, how does how does that how does that happen the for itself is freedom or where do we where are we getting that notion from um, but come back to the source Bergson it all it's all grounded now in something that makes sense okay <clears throat> so that's why I'm calling this metaphysical freedom and it's it's this this is I think the the, the level where the, the free will determinism debate should play out this is this is where it, it's at home um, on this metaphysical level so not on that kind of hot to be a little bit Heideggerian here on the ontic level of um of, of individual people or specific um specific beings uh so we're, we're kind of dodging for now anyway that this question of genes what about your genes they they kind of determine who you are your upbringing that determines who you are you are the people you associated with when you are that determines who you are yada 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 that that stuff is is kind of up here <clears throat> we want to investigate this this question or Bergson's going to investigate this question at this deeper metaphysical level so looking at fundamental reality um, in a way that Merleau-Ponty and Sartre and and even Heidegger couldn't because they weren't doing metaphysics they didn't want to get into this which is um <clears throat> which is fine that's phenomenology but but Bergson's going he's going there he, he's more about metaphysics getting into the metaphysics okay so what does he say about this psychology we've just seen with psychological determinism psychology misled by language treats the person as if they were determined by different emotions acting on him or her like external forces breaks us up into these emotions and these emo emotions or these thoughts they're, they're acting on us like external forces and that's not a true account of what's happening so that there's a spatialized self there right they're spatializing everything throwing everything up um, and and they've lost this core of duration and if you miss that you'll never get freedom back but and this is um, to keep keep going with Bergson the whole soul is reflected in each emotion so instead of these emotions being kind of separate things impacting us our entire being is in each emotion it's reflected in each emo each individual emotion they aren't these separate things out there separate from different from me <clears throat> affecting me 
There is no me separate to them. Um, rather, my entire being, Bergson uses the word soul, obviously not, not a religious notion here, but my whole being, my whole character, my whole personality, my whole self is reflected in every emotion. Cool. Let me give you the quote. The associationist reduces the self to an aggregate of conscious states, sensations, feelings, and ideas. But if he sees in these various states no more than is expressed in their name, if he retains only their impersonal aspect, he may set them side by side forever without getting anything but a phantom self, the shadow of the ego projecting itself into space. If, on the contrary, he takes these psychic states with the particular colouring which they assume in the case of a definite person, and which comes to each of them by reflection from all the others, then there is no need to associate a number of conscious states in order to rebuild the person, for the whole personality is in a single one of them. Okay, cool. So the whole, the idea there, this is, this is not anything new. We've talked about this before. The person, the self, if you want to stretch to it, the consciousness that is you. The, again, I really hate that word, but but um, whatever. The person must be considered as a whole, a totality, uh, a qualitative multiplicity, a multiplicity that is one and, a, and one that is a multiplicity. <clears throat> Which means that, as we saw last week, the... Um, one psychic state is my, that my whole being is reflected in that one because it's not this isolated thing thrust out there external to me, away from me, and away from other psychic states. They're all connected. They're all that. That's the idea of a qualitative multiplicity. That's the idea of duration, right? That succession in which all of the states are interconnected. They're deeply tied together. They melt into each other. Um, and so there's, there's no freedom in a spatialized self, which is what associationism considers, but that's obviously not the real self. So you'll never find freedom if you're looking for it um, if you've already made that that error in spatializing the self, then it will it will always appear as if determinism carries the day. But that's because you've you've created this this um, artificial self, this spatial self, which uh, which doesn't reflect reality. So what is freedom? Let's see if we can get a um, a description definition definition ish. And the outward manifestation of this inner state will be just what is called a free act, since the self alone will have been the author of it, and since it will express the whole of the self. So the outward manifestation of this inner state, that inner state is, is say, a psychic state, an emotion or, or a belief or a thought or whatever. Um, the behavior that, that flows from that will be a free act. Because it's not an isolated thing. It's not that the, that psychic state didn't act on me and cause me to to act further. There's no cause effect chain here. That that psychic state is all of me. <clears throat> I am in that the, the whole the, the totality that I am is in that um, that one psychic state. So an act performed out of the whole self is free. That's kind of the definition here. If you perform an act from your, from from who you are, from that that from that qualitative multiplicity, that that deep um, state in which all of your psychic states are connected in that way, they're melted together. If you can, if you are acting from that. That is what Bergson calls a free act. And that's because that is, again, that's what duration is. It's that succession in which all of the states are tied together. 
they melt into each other. So if you have that, if you and if you're acting from that, in the same way that duration is fundamentally um, the creation of something new, always, then you will also be, your acts will also be the creation of something new, always. Um, <clears throat> again, nothing to do with genes or upbringing, right? These are, the, the, in, in a sense, these come to the party too late. But when, if you consider those, you've already missed the metaphysical truth that we are freedom. Um, cool. And I did want to add something here. I don't think, I'm pretty sure Bergson doesn't call this authenticity. But, um, but it seems to be a pretty good candidate for it. So the, uh, the first thing in this, this little subheading of authenticity is that um, not every state, not every psychic state w which we act from or act um, in relation to gets us this, this, this acting from the whole self. So if you, you might remember in the, the last video, um, I said that some of our beliefs, some of our thoughts, they're kind of, they're fringe, they're more fringe, they're on the outskirts of who we are. We haven't assimilated them yet. Once they're assimilated, then they become a part of us, but, but that's a process. It's not, it's not something that we get. That, that happens just naturally. So some things, say things that we've just accepted on someone else's word, maybe things that we haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about, those things are just kind of more external um, to us. So they, they don't tap into this, into who we really are. They're not a part of our original self. We can, we can, we can bring them in. We can assimilate them more fully, but, but not every psychic state is is in this kind of um, makes it to this to this deep level that we're talking about, uh, and some e examples that he gives here are actions from hypnotic suggestion, for example, or accidental circumstance. These things don't reflect the whole self. When you act <clears throat> as a result of these things, these these are not actions which which come from. Um, the original self which you are uh, and again feelings and ideas that haven't been properly assimilated um, and yeah I think I talked about this in the last video but I really like this idea that um, education things that you learn need to be assimilated need to be and this is going to set off any Heidegger Heidegger readers out there need to be appropriated in order for them to become a part of you, in order for them to kind of sink into this real, to this qualitative multiplicity, to participate in all of your um, other psychic states. So I quite, I quite like that. Um, <clears throat> and it, it seems to gel, I think, with, with my experiences, actually, in just reading these, 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 these texts. Um, it used to kind of um, be a be a mystery to me. I like I'd read a book, and then like, okay, good, you know, I've read it. I felt like I knew. I mean, I understood everything, but then I'd read, jump onto the next book, and it just seemed like I'd forgotten almost everything that I've read in that first book. When I was reading it, it was it seemed all all um, all there. But as soon as I kind of move on to the next project, it just disappears, and um, it's kind of it was kind of the bane of my reading. Um, I'm not, and I'm not talking about things like being in nothingness here. I'm talking about less, less um, involved books. Um, but still, it was it's kind of disturbing. How do I, how can I really acquire knowledge here? Everything I read seems to just drift away is the second I put the book down um, but then it was it was after I really got into things like being in time being in nothingness and um, this just happened by by chance but it was 
because I spend so much time with them. You know, I read them, reread them, summarize them, make um, notes so that I can give these videos, uh, make these videos, um, answer questions. You know, people ask me questions and I, I have to kind of get into the answers and, and revisit my notes, sometimes go back to the text. The, all of this just has really, um, that solidified these ideas for me in a way that um, I, I think you, you can't get, well, I certainly can't. I can't get otherwise if I just read through it and jump onto the next one. I've, I really have to spend time with with a book. And that, that makes exact sense. Uh, well, that really ties in nicely with what Bergson's saying here. Stuff you just pick up, you know, other ideas from other people. You haven't assimilated it. You haven't appropriated it. Um, that only happens when you really, really spend the time, I think. That's the key thing. But once you do that, these ideas become a part of you. And you can, and they make much more sense. Things really start to gel in a way that they never did before. And, and you start making connections, which you never did before, you know. Um, that's something else that, that I've noticed, which, again, it's, it's just a function of time. Time spent pouring through these, these books. So yeah, education has to be assimilated. Once it is, it, it's a part of you. It's deeper than just kind of knowledge. It's, uh, you've integrated it into who you are. And most people live at that superficial level, that level of the spatial self. And so they don't encounter this true freedom. They never kind of realize this freedom, which is their um, who they really are, their fundamental selves. And that's why I think this makes a good candidate for authenticity. Although, again, I'm pretty sure Bergson doesn't call it authenticity in the book. But um, it seems like that works here. You know, once if you can, you make sure that you're acting from um, beliefs and opinions that, that are, are genuine to you, that, that really reflect who you are, that is um, as good a definition, I think, of, of, that's as good of a definition of authenticity, I think, as we can get. Um, so this whole thing, <clears throat> we've talked about freedom basically in terms of duration. It's also describable, and I'm jumping to uh, matter and memory here, also describable in terms of intensities of memory. And... Um, I read one guy, a commentator on Bergson, Vladimir Jankalevich. Jankalevich? I'm not sure. He's Hungarian. I think he was Hungarian. Um, but anyway, he says, memory is the spiritual face of a duration internal to itself. So memory is really a, a key part of duration. And I've touched on it before. We're going to get into much more detail later. Um, and when I touched on it, I called it the engine of duration. Um, Yankelevich's quote is, is nice, but it's pretty tough to get any kind of real meaning from that, I think. The spiritual face of a duration internal to itself. The, the important thing, I think, is that he's connecting memory and duration in a, in a real tight way. Um, so it's the engine of duration, uh, so which means that we can, we can talk about this in terms of intensities of memory. So the function of memory, I, and I've briefly mentioned this, is the prolonging and the contracting of states, psychic states in particular. Um, and so we can, we can then say that by allowing us to grasp in a single intuition multiple moments of duration, it frees us from the movement of the flow of things. That is to say, from the rhythm of necessity. So this act of, of memory, which, which brings everything together, um, allowing us to, to grasp the whole, all, all of these individual um, moments or, or states, grasp them as a whole. It's that which, which gives us um, the creativity in the next moment. Because that, that, that grasp of the whole, which is memory, um, 
changes the next moment. It means that the next moment is something that could never have happened before because any previous moments, even if they were identical in external appearance, they lack that the, the, the totality of the states that you have remembered. So every, every act is always a new act, is always um, a completely free act. It must be in the sense that um, it's it's acting out of duration from this this completely new set of of um, from this completely new foundation which memory gives us. Okay, nice. So that's metaphysical freedom. Let's have a quick look at practical freedom. All right. So practical freedom then <clears throat> is basically. Well, so we're moving up. I, I talk, talked about before the, the movement from, um, in Heideggerian terminology, from onto, ontology to the ontic level. So, okay, we've got this, we've established freedom at this deeper metaphysical level. But what about at this, this higher up level? And I think it's legitimate then to ask, but are we free in the practical everyday, in our, in our practical everyday lives. Hence, practical freedom. And this was, uh, it was interesting when I, when I made this connection or made this distinction in Bergson that it reminded me of, of Kant and Schopenhauer who both talk about an intelligible character, which is um, who we are as the thing in itself versus our empirical character which is who we are as as an appearance and they they both say that the former <clears throat> our intelligible character is free whereas the latter is determined so that or well, the latter is is um predictable we can we can um foresee we can predict exactly what what's going to happen according to the laws of physics and, and so on and so forth. Um, but originally we are, we're free in this considered as, as a part of the thing in itself. Uh, and that, when I, when I read that in um, Kant just recently, actually, when I was reading Critique of Pure Reason, it's, it seemed like, it seemed like I kind of got it. Um, but as you think about it, it's really hard to kind of keep hold of, you know, how how does this work exactly? At the time I was reading it, it, it seemed quite, you know, as I was reading the words, it seemed like a, um, I, I felt like I could see how it worked. But afterwards, as I was thinking about it again, it was like, hang on, how does it work? We're free in this kind of, as a thing in itself but then when we're in if we think about ourselves as empirical um, in the empirical world we're determined and, uh, and essentially though what we have is, is the same thing here with Bergson Bergson metaphysically we're free as duration and so we're free not not in the sense that we can do anything we want not in the sense that um that my actions kind of they're not they're not determined by anything. Well, we are free in that way, uh, but at a meta metaphysical level, it's not. We're not dealing with things like what about this influence? What about that influence? That made you do this, and this is all happening up here at a deeper level. As duration, we're free not because we're free things, but because we we're just freedom itself. And, um, and that makes perfect sense to me. And then it, it also makes perfect sense to me how at, at, a, at a higher level, so when we're thinking about ourselves in the real world, we could be determined despite being at our core, at, at metaphysical, um, rea at the level of metaphysical reality, despite being tr uh, free at that level. Because maybe, yeah, maybe my genes, my upbringing, my all of that stuff just 
it's all following um, precise laws of physics that uh, that mean that, or even even perhaps laws of, of psychology, which just determine me to do certain things. But that happens on the on the um, surface of what is fundamentally free. Free not in the sense that nothing's making me do something. Free in the sense that as duration, every act, every new act is um, unpredictable fundamentally. It's, it's a fundamentally original, novel act. So anyway, we can ask this question. Are we practically free? And uh, so all of this, by the way, is is from creative evolution. So we've, we've jumped to there. And this this was this whole section exploded out of like four lines that I took. Um, so in creative evolution, Bergson talks about comparing us with other animals for whom invention is never anything but a variation on the theme of routine. Shut up in the habits of the species, it succeeds no doubt in enlarging them by its individual initiative, but it escapes automatism only for an instant, for just the time to create a new automatism. The gates of its prison close as soon as they are opened. By pulling at its chain, it succeeds only in stretching it. With man, consciousness breaks the chain. In man and in man alone, it sets itself free. Fantastic quote. I love that. The gates of its prison close as soon as they're open. That's beautiful right there. Um, but yeah, so okay, that's where we're starting. We are free. We are we all we, we, we think we're free. Um, let's start with that. We think we're free, but but an animal, a lower, a, a lesser life form, a lesser creature, without our capacities, without our um, our intellects, is is restricted by its it, its habits, by its inability to break out of those habits. And even if it does manage to set up something new to just to kind of stumble across something new no sooner does it do that than the gates close again and it, it that becomes a new habit that forces itself on the animal on the creature whatever it is um and so that that makes perfect sense to me we don't think of of other animals as being free in the way that we are we don't think of them as having free will perhaps you could extend that to some animals chimps, dolphins, elephants, the, the usual suspects. But eventually, if you go down the, the, um, go down the, the chain, you're going to come to a point where you will say, this animal is, is not free. This creature is not free. It doesn't have anything we would reasonably call free will. So that's what Bergson's noting here. It doesn't really matter where you draw that line. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into that, I think. But at some point, you'll come to a, um, a, a dividing line between animals that have free will and animals that don't. For Bergson, it's, it's high. It's a high bar. And we're the only ones who have free will. Um, and so this has nothing to do with kind of the determinism proper that we looked at in the last section with metaphysical free, free will metaphysical freedom because um, we're talking about habits. We're talking about things that um, constrain a creature at this practical level. Right? Their behavior is constrained at, at this practical, not at that deeper metaphysical versus, sorry, at, at that deeper metaphysical level where we, we hashed out freedom versus determinism. Um, what what's keeping these animals locked in in, in um, automatism is not not that they're um, metaphysically determined in any way, but it's that that they're just stuck in these habits that maybe instinct is just so so strong it just drives them on. There's no there's no way for them to break out of that. Um, so then we can ask, though, how then? How do humans break these chains that hold other animals practically unfree? 
And this is what Bergson says. And this, this is quite an interesting thing to say too. Practical freedom requires the ability to spatialize. So we've been kind of hammering, or I've been kind of hammering spatial, spatializing thought. Um, but this is what exactly what we need in order to have practical freedom. So we need to turn to the intellect here. And uh, Bergson identifies three things that we need in order to, to attain practical freedom. The first is, is the brain. So this, um, the reason the brain is so important here is not because it, it generates any, we've well, already seen this, it doesn't generate anything unextended, it doesn't do anything magical. But what it does do is allows the building of, a, of an unlimited number of motor mechanisms with which to oppose old habits. So our brain is, is the way it's, it's constructed, the way, it's, it's, um, the way it works is it, it creates these new actions. It has, it has scope for um, setting up new actions and, and an unlimited number of them. We're, we, are, we can imagine, whatever we imagine, we can, we can, can, can become a new habit can become something that we we decide to implement later so it has this capacity for setting up these different reactions these motor mechanisms to external stimuli um, and in doing so it delays that reflex response that reflex action which in which there's no thought right so you get receive a stimulus and it, if, if an action just happens automatically, then and then that is, is quite determined, right? It's not determined in the strong sense of metaphysically determined, but it's determined in the sense that you, however we think about you, can't change it. It just happens automatically, like an animal. Um, but our brains, what they do is they delay that stimulus response process so now we get the stimulus and there's a there's it sets up a delay in which we can make a choice from a number of different alternatives and that's an option that doesn't exist for every animal Bergson calls it a zone of indetermination in matter and memory um, so that's what the brain does nothing special nothing magical but it it has the capacity for forming these an unlimited number of motor responses and it sets up this it, it delays our response to stimuli and that in doing that it creates kind of creates space if you like for um, a choice the first time a genuine choice could take place so that's the first thing it needs or in humans, it's it's attained through a brain. It's also attained, it also needs language. That's the second thing. And he's got a nice quote for this. He talks about language which furnishes consciousness with an immaterial body in which to incarnate itself and thus exempts it from dwelling exclusively on material bodies whose flux would soon drag it along and finally swallow it up. Another great quote, but um, but you can see there the, the point. Language gives us this break from the physical, from the present, from, from just what's happening around us. It gives us the capacity to abstract, for abstract thought. It lets us step out of material, the material necessity of this thing happening, I react. This happens, I react. Now we can, language lets us kind of spatialize. It lets us throw these things up and juxtapose them to each other and think about them um, at a level which we can't do if we're just purely living. If, we, if we're purely in this duration, we have no capacity to get out um, without this, this intellectualizing capacity. It's like a our capacity for higher cognition, right? That's what we're talking about. 
the ability to ab to think abstractly, to generalize. And this is all comes down to the intellect. And and again, it's what we're doing, what we're talking about is spatializing what's what's happening. The final thing that he uh, mentions is social life, or perhaps culture, I think would, would work in here too. And this stores and preserves efforts the same way that language stores thought, allowing us then to kind of build on what has come before, what people have done before. So we're not always starting from from zero, which is basically what we see in the rest of the animal kingdom. Even even animals that I think, you know, that we, we kind of think, we, we, we talk about chimps learning, but teaching their um, adult chimps, teaching the, the young chimps, but it's not really teaching. They're not really doing any, any genuine form of teaching. There's no education going on, right? Um, that that's too grandiose a term for what's happening. It's more like see and mimic, you know. And and the but the I mean the adults they know that they have to show the the young what to do. So there is a level there's this like a level of cognition there, but it's nowhere near the level I think where we would want to say there's genuine education taking place. Um, and so that means that every every animal is kind of on their own starting from 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 zero because there is no um, there is no there isn't that that deep element of culture behind this the um, the society so those three things the brain language and social life they let us abstract out from um, what's what's kind of taking place before us at the moment in in the in the real world they let us <clears throat> step back from it and, and um analyze it spatially analyze it in a way that that um, other animals can't so then what about genes now can we ask about genes upbringing what about all of these things are these complete constraints on our freedom do they do they um, force us to act in certain ways maybe that may maybe that, that aren't predictable but that are nevertheless things that we we, um, we can't say we choose things that just um, you know we're just swept up in this big causal chain well now we're on the right level anyway so the question of genes and upbringing and environment and now we're at the at the right level for this to be a potential um, to end our, our practical freedom but I think the fact that we have um, the fact that we we're able to abstract out like this the fact that we're able to generalize the fact that we're able to cognize in the way that we are um, that means that we can we can always take a position on these things we can always step back from the um the co the causal chain that's come before or the so it's not even a causal chain then is it but we can step back and and look at prior events and see what happened and analyze that in in a way that i think it's 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 incompatible with saying that we're then determined that we're that we're that we're um our behaviors are, are, are completely caused by prior situations um there is the 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 problem or the the uh the response i guess the objection to that is that well you, you can step back and look at um what your genes say or or how your upbringing has has kind of shaped your behavior yeah you can t step back and take a position on it <clears throat> but st that stepping back you don't get outside of of yourself you're just you're stepping back into um another 
situation which is completely caused by other things, by other events. Um, so you, you kind of never, you're never able to, to fully get out of, of your situation. You're never, you're never completely a causal, I guess is what the objection is. And that's, that's true. Um, but the problem with it is that it's still kind of thinking of, of yourself as, um, this discrete entity that that has no um well that, that is discrete that's separate from everything else and which these these events these life events happen to right my emotions happen they happen to me and that makes me do something my upbringing was was this particular way these events all happen to me and that makes me do something. Well, if you think about yourself in that way, that self doesn't exist, right? You aren't that self. That, that I mean, it, it's a fiction. It's not even real. So the, the very, um, the kind of opening position here for the person who wants to claim that, that we're just effects of, and of, of a chain of, of causes, um, starts from this that has to presuppose that we are this independent thing which is just being acted we're just another billiard ball on the table other billiard balls are hitting us and making us do stuff but but that that for that idea that we are a billiard ball is exactly what it's cartesian dualism now you can't get more cartesian dualist than that right that, that you're this little thing and all these other events, all these other billiard balls bounce into you and make you careen off in different directions. Um, you're starting from this position of, of Cartesian dualism, which, of course, the determinists would argue they don't believe in. But that's precisely the, the assumption. That's, what, that's the assumption which makes the, which gives the argument, it's the, which gives the objection its force, right? That we are this little homunculi, homunculus, which is being impacted by all these other things. We aren't. That doesn't exist. So I'm not, again, I'm not being, uh, my, my emotions don't cause me to do something because I am my emotions. There is nothing separate from that, you know? The events don't make me do something because I am those events. Those events are, they include me. I'm not separate from them. I'm not the standalone Cartesian mind, which is being just jostled around by, by events and feelings and, and thoughts and beliefs. Uh, these things are all, and this is where we, we kind of, end up back at the, the metaphysical level, we are not a separate Cartesian mind. We are a qualitative multiplicity. Everything that's happening is, um, I'm not smelling the rose and, and getting something from an external source, which is, is affecting me as a different entity. That whole thing is me. The smelling of the rose and the memories, that, that is all me. There's nothing else there. So the objection itself, I think, flounders because it, it, it must suppose, it must presume that we are Cartesian minds, which means it doesn't work. Um, and that's my last point here. Practical freedom must be, I think, ultimately grounded in metaphysical freedom. So if you don't, if you're not metaphysically free, if we had ruled on that um, in the other direction and said we were determined at that level, then practical freedom is out already. Um, I think you could have metaphysical freedom and um, and and yet be practically practically unfree. I think that that would make sense. Um, but I think the capacity we have for abstract thought lets us step out of that the um 
the cause and effect chain which dominates other um, inanimate objects and also other animals that, that don't have that same capacity. But again, that, <clears throat> that abstract, that capacity for abstract thought, that capacity uh, or the bra brain which gives us unlimited motor mechanisms, um, language which lets us create this immaterial body, letting us get back, st step out of our kind of our situation, our, the habits that that um, stimulus response get us step out of that whole situation, and social life, the the culture, which um, which we're all born into, and which um, again gives us an, uh, just a, a higher platform from which to to start um, these this ability to think in that in that way with the intellect um, because it's grounded in metaphysical freedom means that gives us practical freedom as well <laughs> I hope that makes sense I've um, yeah let me just finish up what I I've got a couple more points to make uh, there, I thought it was interesting that there's this irony with um, spatial thinking, spatial thinking, and that it grants us practical freedom. But if we use that spatial thinking to think of ourselves spatially, then we end up believing that we're determined. So it's, not, it's an interesting irony there that um, we need it to, to have practical freedom. Um, but at the same time, if we if we kind of misuse it, if we turn it back on ourselves and analyze ourselves as, <clears throat> you know, a, a conglomerate of psychic states which are all uh, acting on me like an external force, then then we get this picture that we are we're determined. So it's it's like a it's like, it's like a blessing and a curse. It's a it's a good thing if we use it wisely, uh, if we use it directed in the right way. But it can be um, an impediment if we if we misuse it, if we end up trying to think about ourselves in, um, in spatial terms. So that was interesting, uh, and and also I have I've mentioned this before. I just want to drill this idea home one last time. I've all you know we've always always talked about spatial thinking as as kind of the negative the bad thing it's, it's the abstract it's the artificial it's not really there it takes us off on these leads us down garden paths that go nowhere um that that's the intellect right the, the capacity we that gives us the capacity for spatializing um things that are not originally spatial things like duration um, but it's not it's not negative in that way. It's not it's not a bad thing again unless we kind of misuse it. So we've just seen this way in which it's it's incredibly helpful and in that it gives us practical freedom. Without that ability to step back from our situation, we we couldn't um, engage that part of ourselves which, or we couldn't engage in a way that that lets us act with genuine freedom in, in any situation. Again, not freedom which is un like um, independent of any other event, but freedom which is um, which includes those other events. Other events kind of act on us or, or happen to us, um, but we. They, they don't act on us with the force of a necessitating cause. I think that's the best way to put it. It's the way Malopondi puts it as well. Things happen to us, you know, genes or whatever, um, other events, upbringing. But these things, they don't, they don't act on us in the same way that a billiard ball bouncing into another billiard ball or hitting another billiard ball will cause a definite and determinate reaction, uh, which you can measure, which you can predict. Um, that's not the kind of, of causality, I guess, that, that's taking place here. And again, it's, that's because of our capacity for this abstract thinking. All right, let me get off this. I, I'm, I fear I'm going around in circles a little bit with that now. 
But uh, but I thought it was interesting there that that we we had to bring that in because Bergson talks about it in um, Creative Evolution, and it really is quite different. Those three those three features he mentions it's quite different from what we were talking about in Time and Free Will with uh, what I've called metaphysical um, freedom. So summary time. So first up, we looked at determinism, two arguments for determinism, starting with the physical, uh, where we focused on the conservation of energy. And we saw that that ultimately reduces to psychological determinism, which was associationism. And the problem with this was that it treats the self as spatial. It ultimately presents the self as something which it isn't. And... Um, and because of that, it makes it look as if the self is part of this causal chain um, when when that's not what's happening. The self is, we've already seen, it's duration. Duration is, is that fundamentally, it's, it's, a, it's a freedom, not free. And that brings us to metaphysical freedom, where we saw we, we're not free as a property, rather we are freedom itself. And that links us, that, that the, the, the grounds for that, uh, so the justification for that is in the fact that we are duration. So metaphysical freedom came from an action which was performed out of the whole self. So performed from a psychic state in which our whole self was, is reflected. And that was a good definition of authenticity. Um, and we also saw that not every act is then authentic because we don't always act out of emotions or, or desires which which reflect who we are fundamentally at that fundamental at that level of the fundamental self. We also talked about that in terms of intensities of memory, uh, so that the connection between memory and duration is quite a tight one. We'll investigate that in more detail later. But we can we can get the same um, we can come to the same understanding by looking at, at memory. And finally, we looked at practical freedom, which revealed that we are free because of our intellects, because of our capacity for abstract thought, our capacity to to spatialize what is fundamentally not spatial. And we also saw that that was grounded in metaphysical freedom anyway. Okay, cool. So that's um, the first video on freedom. It's quite a long one, I think. Um, but the I'm going to do one more video on this. Um, we need to look at a couple more things that he Bergson talks about in Time and Free Will that I want to get to. Um, and I will see you around for that. Hopefully this made sense to you. Um, it was an Like I said, it was an interesting video. It's an interesting video to prep for. Um, but I think I quite like that notion, metaphysical and, and practical freedom. Anyway, I hope, I hope it made sense for you. Um, thanks for listening, as always, and I will catch you next time.